Well, the, the biggest difference is probably obvious. It's the size of the rink. Um, you know, in Canada, it's 200 by 85, and in Europe, uh, the international size rinks are 200 by 100, and that forces uh, somewhat of an adjustment in your tactics. Um, you know, so that's probably the biggest difference for sure. Um, and because of that, um, the spontaneity, the, 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 the physical play, uh, the intensity around the North American game is different uh, than it is in Europe, where it's more collaboration, a little bit more of a chess match uh, with high level of skill. I, I, you know, I think the top end coaches can coach anywhere. You know, I, I don't know that it matters too much of where they are. I think, um, you know, we, we, if you're a good coach, you'll be able to adjust accordingly. Um, so I, I don't know that there's a big difference. Um, but what we've always said is that the arena is the same size inside the face-off dots. Um, you know, so protect that area and attack that area, and uh, the game's the same size. Well, like every generation, there's adjustments you have to make. Um, you know, growing up, I'm sure my parents looked at me and wondered where the heck I was coming from. But uh, the bottom line is that every generation requires, um, you know, a, a different uh, form of teaching. Uh, they have different learning styles. They have different needs. They have different aspirations. Uh, they have different methodologies. The idea behind good coaching is to recognize what that is, um, to be current, uh, to communicate with your players, to know what is in their world, um, you know, so that you can work with them accordingly. Um, at the end of the day, and as much as it's a team game, um, you still coach a team game one player at a time. And you need to know your players, you need to know what excites them, what motivates them, uh, you need to know what type of um, extraneous influences they have in their life, uh, you know, that might make hockey uh, a bit more of a challenge for them, um, and be able to coach with that in mind. I, I think that um, principles always stand the test of time. Um, it doesn't matter what generation. Um, I do believe, though, that what needs to change um, from time to time is that method of communication. Uh, technology is very much a part of our world nowadays. Uh, coaches communicate more and more through um, you know, that, that level of technology uh, than they do face-to-face. -face. Uh, but with that being said, uh, the, it is the principles that will always stand the test of time. So you can, you can still coach to those principles. You have to know what is available to the player, um, what is required in terms of them understanding, um, you know, what is required of them, and doing it with, uh, with as little contempt as you possibly can. It's, it's, it's the why generation for a reason, and we should be able to answer the question why. They, to, to play in the national, to coach in the National Hockey League, to coach professionally, no, they don't. They don't need any certification. But to coach in Hockey Canada, um, you know, in, in the amateur game, they need to be certified. And there are different levels of certification. Uh, they may not have to come and run at the ground floor uh, to be certified. They may can't come in a, a couple of steps beyond that, but they still require certification in order to coach amateur hockey. When it comes to professional hockey, um, there's no restrictions, um, you know, from the NHL or the American Hockey League or, or whatever. Um, but certainly from Hockey Canada's point of view, coaches need to be certified. Um, I don't think it's difficult at all. I think what might be difficult is uh, for those that have a, a hard time communicating, um, for those that are so regimented they can't flex, um, you know, and, and, and learn different ways to communicate, uh, that can be difficult. Staying abreast of the changes, uh, staying ahead of the game, I don't think is that difficult. There are lots of resources in your colleagues. Uh, there are lots of resources through publications, um, through digital media, uh, you know, that help you stay current. Um, but what you need to work on is your method of communication, uh, you know, to make the message clear uh, and consistent. That is probably the greater issue. I'm not sure. Good question. Uh, first and foremost, you, you have to know the game. <clears throat> you have to know the rules of the game. You have to know how it's played. Um, you know, you need to know, um, you know, what what style of play uh, is is dominant. 
Uh, you have to know everything you possibly can about how the game is played and how best to coach it. Uh, you need to be able to communicate. Uh, you have to be able to communicate in any number of ways, as I mentioned earlier. Um, but you, most important of all, you need to know uh, where, when, how, uh, and why uh, to communicate. Uh, you know, and you need to have that sixth sense, uh, which is intuition, uh, just to feel, uh, you know, so that you can communicate uh, as well. And that's probably a, a, a great intangible, is feel. Um, you know, beyond that, I think it's essential that, uh, that, a, that a coach has a set of principles that he coaches by. Um, you know, that uh, he stays true to who he is. Uh, he doesn't try to be someone else. We all borrow bits and pieces of what we see and learn, uh, you know, from other people, from other coaches in this instance. Uh, at the same time, a coach has to remain authentic. He has to be himself. Uh, if he's not himself, players uh, will, will, will figure that out real quickly. Uh, so, so that, too, is, is absolutely essential. I think you need to use the people around you. You have to respect the fact that uh, players are a great resource, um, you know, and to tap into your players to get a feel for where they are and, and, and what is going on helps you stay current with what's going on off the ice but also on the ice. I think that's critical. And then respect your coaching staff. Respect the people around you, um, you know, to, to understand that they too need to grow. They need the opportunity to develop and grow under your leadership and that when you give them a responsibility, that responsibility belongs to them. And so it's a function of making sure that everyone grows by your leadership and in a lot of cases at the expense of your own ego. And if you're capable of doing that, um, you'll develop good leaders and good teams. Well, the, the hope is that they played, uh, to be honest with you. It, it's hard to coach a sport um, without having connected with it, without having that physical and emotional connection to actually playing. Um, that being said, uh, it's also very, very important to remain loyal, again, to who you are, uh, to remain loyal to the pursuit, um, to recognize there'll always be setbacks, uh, there'll always be hurdles to overcome, uh, but you have to persevere, um, you have to show character, uh, and you have to under understand that um, integrity is a, is, a, is a key part of, of leadership. And um, uh, to me, integrity is the ethical accuracy of your actions. So it's not just the function of saying the right thing, it's also about doing the right thing. And so for those that are hoping to coach, um, it's, just, it's one thing to say the right thing and be able to re read out of a textbook or some type of a technical implication. It's another thing to do it um, and, and um, act accordingly, act on what you're talking about and deliver that too. Uh, their commitment, uh, no question their ability to work uh, and stay with it, no question. Their ability to take direction and their desire to learn and get better every single day. Um, I appreciate the fact that they want the best out of me and they expect the best out of me. Uh, that keeps me sharp, keeps me mentally focused uh, and makes me perform at a high level. Uh, and then I also appreciate the fact that uh, players are uh, also advocates of activity and sport and what is good in sport. And, uh, and we need them to be vocal. And we need athletes in any sport to speak on behalf of what it is they love to do, what they love to participate in, uh, because kids now have the option of being active or not. And we need, we need people to step up and holler loud and clear, get active. I, I think it is. I, I think uh, you know, families and kids have choices. And it's not always activity. And uh, I think technology, the digital age, has had a tremendous benefit, uh, beneficial effect on our, on our society, on the, on the population worldwide. At the same time, it's hurt us badly um, because we have become more of a sedentary population. Um, we're not as active as we used to be. Uh, we will have mental health issues. We will have physical health issues. Um, and we have obesity um, throughout the planet because people are less and less inclined to get busy and stay active. And that's a problem, that's dangerous. Well, we, we can't marginalize parents, we, we have to include them. Um, you know, if we exclude them from what it is we do, we just upset them that much more and there's a good chance that they will take their child out of the sport. So we can't marginalize parents, we can ask for their help, we can ask for their opinions, uh, we can show them our seasonal plan 
and let them know exactly how we plan on coaching. Let them be a part of that process. Let them understand better what it is you hope to do and then coach to those principles. Um, when you deviate from that, that's when you'll have a parent that will have a problem. But if everyone is playing by the same rules, if all the parents hear the same thing at the same time in terms of your philosophy and how you're going to implement your, your season um, through their children, uh, they will have less problem. And at the end of the day, it does become a function of principles and values for the coach. And any good parent understands that. Uh, the hardest decision I've ever made was to release a player from uh, the 1994 Olympic team in preparation for Lillehammer. And um, he had played for me as a 16-year-old. He had played junior for me. And he came back as a young adult and uh, was trying to make the Olympic team, and he was the last cut. And uh, I had a good relationship with him, of course. I'd, uh, we had helped each other. He helped me as a coach. I helped him as a player. And to circle back uh, to the one and only opportunity that he ever really wanted in hockey to play for his country in the Olympic Games and to take that away from him was pretty difficult. Thank you.